not been so much in terms of the specifics of the research itself. And uh, so I'm not really uh, a melanin researcher uh, in the sense of, uh, of Dr. King, Dr. Carol Barnes, uh, uh, Dr. Stewart here, and other people whose work you're looking at and things that you've been exposed to. Uh, instead, uh, my interest is much more in terms of melanin as another dimension of, uh, of many of the things that we're doing just in terms of trying to rediscover and redevelop uh, African science in a very general sense. And uh, one of the things I talked about this morning that I'll probably be somewhat repetitive with today is in terms of just trying to look at African science and understand something of what it's all about. So let me just sort of try to put my interest and, um, and fascination uh, with melanin within that perspective uh, you know, for you. And uh, then we just sort of go with whatever questions or concerns or interests you might have. One of the things that uh, we did in Voodoo IQ was that, um, well, the very title of the article itself, and certainly the, uh, the overall content of what the article Voodoo or IQ uh, really sort of introduces, is the fact that what's probably wrong with the, the, the vast majority of the research that has been done on African people is that it's been operating out of essentially a foreign paradigm. And what Voodoo IQ suggests is that, uh, I'm sure you know, you know from other classes that you know, just a paradigm really pretty much like sets the limits of your observations. You know, it says that what is real falls within the limits of that paradigm. So if you say that what is real is, as we said this morning, is something that's perceivable, perceivable by the, the five senses, then that becomes a quality of what's within the paradigm that has to be tangible. Uh, what is real is what you and I can agree upon is real. So you need consensual validation. That's another aspect of the paradigm. What is real must be measured in some way. So the whole question of measurability. If you can't measure it, it's not real. So the paradigm then limits observations to this particular, that particular sphere. Anything that may be quote unquote real and invisible, or something that may be real that comes to me by inspiration or revelation would not count here. So revelation is eliminated. Uh, what is real but cannot be measured? it somehow transcends measures, then that, of course, would fall outside of that. So any experience that does not fall within the limits of that is considered unreal, unscientific, or certainly not characteristic of what Western science is really all about. The whole uh, the conflict or the alternatives that we tried to present in Voodoo IQ was to suggest that Western science, characterized by the kind of IQ notion, the idea that human intelligence is measurable, tangible, and all those other kinds of things, objective, uh, falls within a paradigm that limits human possibility to that particular kind of box. Voodoo is just a, a general way of talking about another paradigm, another approach to understand what it is that human beings are capable of. And in the process of doing so, you begin to get into spheres that are not limited by what's measurable, tangible, and so forth and so on. Now, what this means then is that it's always very interesting uh, to, to understand how the paradigm begins to work. Because paradigms not only serve as a criteria for checking out what's acceptable, what's illegitimate, what's legitimate within the confines of the paradigm, but it's also a conditioning process. So people then find themselves forced to think in terms of the paradigm. And once you have accepted the paradigm as your way of perceiving things, it's really very difficult for people to move beyond that because it becomes a, a restricting uh, kind of resource. Um, it, it, in fact, it, almost, it can almost limit your thinking capabilities. One of the things that happens to children is that children have a vast capacity to experience a wide range of things. 
fantasy, reality, subjective things, objective things, things in, things out, and sort of like move in and out several spheres of reality very comfortably. And that's why children can play the game, the game can be as real as can, quote unquote, the real thing, because the children have that kind of flexibility in their consciousness. What we do with children as we put them in preschool, kindergarten, and other school settings and on up the line is that we gradually take them out of their kind of broad experience of reality and begin to force them into the limited paradigms that we offer to them. And even by the time our children finish high school, that they do it successfully in the Western system, most of us have become so restricted in our thinking that we can only fit into this kind of box about what's real. So if someone then comes along at some future point and suggests certain realities to you that exist outside of the, of the bounds of this box, most of us have a great deal of difficulty relating to that because we've gone from this possibility, this early capability to this locked in and limited capability and someone begins to invite us out and it becomes for, rather frightening to us. It's frightening in the sense that it's new, it's different, the guidelines that exist within the, uh, uh, the, para the previous paradigm don't apply, and it becomes very, very uncomfortable. So when people start talking about spirituality, they start talking about uh, revelation, they start talking about intuition, they start talking about psychic capability, they start talking about the soul, they start talking about all these other kinds of things, that don't fit within that other paradigm, it becomes very frightening. Now, if you have a lot of investment in this box, then you act like white people act. You go crazy on them. You don't give people tenure, you don't publish their papers, you fire them, you call them stupid, you don't give them degrees, you put an F on the paper when people come up with ideas that don't fit into the paradigm. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that people retaliate in order to assert the legitimacy of their paradigm. And the more committed you are to that, the more frightening other possibilities appear to you. The degree to which you are, you can begin to loosen yourself up to move beyond that, it still is difficult because it means kind of an undoing, like you're really breaking down limits in your thinking. You have to begin to remove limitations in your thinking to adopt another kind of paradigm. And that was the issue that uh, the, the Voodoo IQ uh, really tried to address. Now, Given the idea then, that we are suggesting that the Western paradigm is limited because it is unidimensional primarily and deals with only one sphere of the full reality. So if, if the world is a circle, you know, if, if, if reality is actually a circle, then Western science really takes like just a fragment of that circle, which it defines as real, and discounts everything else. Now, why is this important in approach to melody? The issue that we suspect that we're going to find out about melody, and many people have already suggested that there, there's real speculation for that, particularly uh, Richard King's work, is that we're going to find a multidimensional reality, a multidimensional reality. Now, let me just sort of give you very quickly some of the dimensions of the, of, of some of the dimensions of the reality of melody. Uh, in Western science, the assumption is that a thing can only be one thing, okay? The whole idea that logic requires that if A is A and not B, then A cannot be both A and B, all right? I mean, that's like illogical. There is something that is referred to as diunital logic. Uh, there's an article that's written by Vernon Dixon in a collection of papers that you might have run across in some of the other classes. It's called uh, Assumptions and Paradigms for the Study of African People. It's done by the Fanad Center. Do any of you familiar with that at all? That, 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 okay, that publication. It's a very interesting article, but he talks about what he refers to as diunital logic. And diunital logic permits things to both be and not be at the same time. So in diunital logic, A cannot be B while being B at the same time. Now that's strange, you know, in terms of the kind of logic we're accustomed to. And I'm going to explain to you more specifically what that means in just a minute. But when you begin to think in the, this paradigm suggests that if a thing is A, it cannot possibly be B. 
Whereas the Dayuta logic, which is a broader logic, says that, yeah, well, thank you both the A and B. So we're suggesting then that we have to understand Melvin from a diunital logical perspective. Now, what does that mean? That means then that we have to understand that it has several dimensions, and neither dimension uh, destroys the authenticity of other dimensions. So by being one thing, that doesn't mean it's not also the other thing. But in order to understand the fullness of the, the meaning of melanin, you must be able to understand it in its multiple uh, expressions. Now let's look at it very quickly. Probably the first person to write about melanin, as you already know, is Francis Press Welsing. Now Francis Welsing had a very simple notion of melanin. She says that melanin has to do with that quality, which is the predominant quality <laughs> of most life on Earth, and that is the ability to produce color. And that is the form of most life forms. And it is a natural form. The degree to which you are incapable of producing color is the degree to which you are representing a mutant life form. Because natural life forms produce color, plants, animals, people, so forth and so on. And if you don't produce color, then of course you represent a mutant, and therefore you are potentially extinguishable. Because mutants don't live very long. They eventually become eradicated because they are a mutant strand. But the natural dominant human strand, according to Francis's ideas, was the ability to produce color. Now, she went from there, from that kind of state, she said nothing else about melanin, nothing about the biochemistry of it, nothing about what it was. It was just a manifestation of who we were. So her argument then is that because of the fact that people, Caucasian people, have less of an ability to produce color, and in fact she goes on to say they really don't have the ability to produce color, they're really albinos, that's not really true, but they really have less of a capacity to produce color, then because of that then they begin to respond in a way that uh, tries to protect themselves be from becoming genetically annihilated. So her theory was essentially a social psychiatric theory. She explained, and her objective has always been in her writings, has been what she calls a counter-racist psychiatry. She's been trying to understand and counter racism. Her emphasis was not on the understanding of black people. If you read Frances Wilson's works on melanin, she never talks about the meaning of melanin for the psychic functioning of black people. That's not her interest. Her interest was explaining why white people were racist. And she essentially argues they were racist because they were deficient in melanin, and therefore their social psychological conduct was as a re reaction against the possibility of genetic annihilation. And that was the extent of her analysis. Okay? Now, when uh, McGee began to talk about melanin, he began to talk about melanin as being not only a characteristic of black people in general, but he began to talk about the implications for black behavior. So he began to talk about the, the kind of fine tuning of the nervous system that accounts for our very synchronized and rhythmic kinds of activities that we have as a people. Uh, our relationship to music and to the arts as being a, a result of the fact that melanin is a refiner. It refines trans neurologically transmitted impulses through the nervous system. And the fact that it exists throughout the nervous system, I'm sorry, that the fact that it exists throughout the body actually make us have a nervous system everywhere. So rather than the sensory sensation, neurological sensations that are usually limited in Western thinking to the brain and the central nervous system, he begins to suggest that the biochemistry of melanin actually expands throughout the entire body. And it begins to make some real statements about the difference in the nature of the functioning of black people, all right? So McGee begins to talk about uh, the psychological functioning of African people. OK, another dimension. Now, that does not mean that Francis Wilson is not correct. It means that Francis Wilson stopped there, and that was one aspect of melanin. In fact, that probably has a lot to do with why it is that Caucasian people act the way they do. It probably has a lot to do with the ongoing worldwide conflict between the races. Because when you look at the world, you essentially find a confrontation between people of color and people of non-color. 
And that seems to be like a, a motif, at least in modern history. So that's a very interesting way to understand that problem, and it makes sense, OK? So it's not incorrect. It's simply a part of the picture, which is all right when you understand this whole kind of multidimensional, diunital logic. You know? So it is this, but it is also this. And the two things are not necessarily opposed to each other. Then along comes Richard King. And he begins to talk about another dimension. He begins to talk about the pineal gland, and begins to talk about the soul, and begins to talk about melanin as being the, the mystical substance of blackness, out of which all reality is emerged, and begins to talk about infinite realities in time and space, and goes to someplace altogether with it. So melanin then becomes a spiritual discussion, in addition to a psychological one, in addition to uh, social psych psychiatric phenomena to explain racism, it becomes all of that as well. You know. Now, the fascinating thing about this whole topic that I, I, I want to call your attention to in terms of why this becomes possible, uh, last week at the pre-conference on melanin that took place over in uh, 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 at, uh, Wayne Nobles' Institute in, in Oakland, uh, present as presenters at that conference was a biochemist, a physicist, a psychiatrist, uh, a developmental psychologist. What is Malachi Andrews? What does he do? Kinesiologist. Huh? Kinesiologist. Kinesiologist? Kinesiologist? Yeah. Kinesiologist? Like sports, medicine kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, body? Okay. Yeah, movement, movement stuff. Okay. Now, this is the this epitomizes the argument that I'm making. Melanin represents a breakthrough in terms of breaking through the paradigmatic limitations of Western science. What I mean by that is that there's almost no other subject that you can identify in terms of current scientific interest among Western scientists that could comfortably accommodate this kind of diversity of people. You understand what I'm saying? Like Western science says that the science that these people deal with is real science. And this stuff is pseudoscience. That this psychologist stuff, you know, like that's soft science. And this is hard science. And for that reason, you can't get these people to talk to each other. You know, I mean, the kind of stuff that these people are dealing with, maybe they have to make, pull in chemical data, but chemists don't have any real respect for this soft-minded stuff down here, you know. And then when you throw in a few mystics, you know, because they have some mystics there too. <laughs> <laughs> then of course, you know, they aren't even permitted in the room. I mean, these are, I mean, these are next to the psychiatric patients. So we don't even consider them as having any legitimate contribution. So you've got mystics, biochemists, physicists, respecting each other and bringing together complementary data that begins to expand precisely the same concept. So melanin then has served as a gravitating, attractive force that has pulled together a diverse array of intellectual, intellectuals and minds and scholars and focused them on that issue and has brought them into a compatible research in the process of doing so. So we have here a microcosm of the rebirth of African science without realizing, you see. So let's like jump up to another dimension and look at the same, the same issue. Unless melanin was as powerful as we say that it is, it would not be capable of engendering that kind of exploratory interest from that kind of diversity of people. So even if you don't buy anything else, what you need to account for to me is how it is that this question could bring together this kind of diversity of people around that single issue. And for me, that becomes an affirmation in and of itself that there's more in that pigment than the eye, the mind, or the soul can perceive. And the, the, the beginning dawning of that reality is found in the diversity of what's here. And the reason for it is 
is that it is a multidimensional reality. Melanin has to do with skin color, it has to do with behavior, it has to do with consciousness, it has to be do with thought, it has to do with spiritual transformation, it has to do with cosmic connectedness, it has to do with timelessness, spacelessness, and all that goes with it. It's all that. And when this biochemist starts talking about it, he starts talking about it as if he is describing the totality of chemistry in that one little paradigm. So melanin can do almost everything, you know, in terms of biochemically. When you read Dr. King's discussion of the black dot, you understand that all truth is in the black dot. So it can do almost anything. You know, when you start reading about the power of sensitivity that McGee talks about with it, then you begin to talk about that. When you begin to talk about the process of refining the nervous system, the developmental processes that Dr. Stern talks about, you begin to find out it has infinite capabilities with that. So this one single concept there begins to demonstrate just a, an instance of the power of African science. And that's the point I want to stop on before I open it up, is that the study of melanin is only one issue. The ancients in ancient Egypt were able to find the same magnitude of ramifications in everything they studied. Everything they studied brought together the same kind of diverse interests and the same kind of diverse expertise as we are talking about with the, the melanin pigment. Okay, let me give you one brief example of that in our eye quotes. Uh, you remember with the scarab? Have you ever seen the scarab? You know what the scarab is? It's a dung beetle, D-U-N-G. You know what dung is? I mean, you know, city folks, you know what dung is. Uh, yeah. Dung is boo-boo, okay? <laughs> dung beetle. These little beetles are uh, uh, strange little creatures. You know, they, uh, they live in dung piles, and uh, they lay their eggs in dung. You know, in human or animal, whatever, it doesn't matter. They lay it in dung, and then they roll the eggs in the dump. And as they roll the egg, life is generated in the egg. The egg becomes fertilized and begins to develop in the dump. So the dump heap becomes a feeding area. The movement becomes a life generating activity. And so the dump then actually becomes like the, the, the bringer of life. The rolling of the dump is the bringer of life for the scarab eggs that are found in there. Now the ancient Egyptians, as you know, exalted the scarab to an image of God. I mean, like, you, know, the, you know, rather than putting God in the limited form of a human being, they saw in the scarab the symbolism for the movement of the sun around the earth and how life was generated as the sun rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. It rolled the planet and rolled around the planet. And the process of doing so, life was constantly being generated and regenerated. And that was the image of Ra. That was the image of Ra that the ancients were able to see in that. So that means then, the study of the behavior and the conduct of something as simple as the dung beetle came to be the metaphysical statement about the nature of the cosmos itself. And that was, that's the way it always worked. They were always moving from the most simple to the most complex. Another example. There's an animal that's called a jackal. Uh, which is a scavenger. Uh, they, you know, they like hyenas and buzzards and other kinds of animals. They live on dead, dead, uh, uh, on dead animals. Um, the jackal has a, a very interesting sensitivity, and that is that the jackal must eat meat that is rotted but not putrefied. When it rots, it's still palatable to his system. When it becomes putrefied, the kind of festering deterioration that goes along with putref putrefaction, I guess it's called, uh, will poison the system. And so there's a very delicate point of distinction between meat that is rotted and meat that is putrefied. Now, he then, with his nose, must discriminate between the fine lines of whether this meat is actually simply rotted or putrefied. So of all the animals, the jackal, according to the ancients, had one of the finest discriminating abilities of all forms of animal life. Now, if you go back into the Egyptian, the book of coming forth by day, and the Egyptian description, the jackal is the one who brings the, the, the person at the final judgment to Osiris, the jackal-headed netter, if you will, brings the, 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 uh, brings the soul 
of the person to Osiris to be judged. So when you get ready to have your hard way to find out if you deserve to be able to move into the higher life or not do so, uh, move into the, uh, the, to the, uh, to the afterworld with Osiris there, the jackal is the one who stands judge. He's the one who holds the scale uh -huh. to determine whether or not your heart is light enough to balance the feather of mind. Um, uh, which is the feather of truth and justice. So the feather is put on one side of the scale, uh, the heart is put on the other side of the scale, and it's held in the balance by the jackal, by the, the Anubis is his name, but by jackal. And the jackal's discriminating abilities is the thing that serves, as, that, that is really very critical in terms of understanding that. So even a scavenger has been exalted to a godlike cosmic capability because of his discriminating his judgmental capabilities, the precision of judgment as being a critical characteristic of, of life in its developing form. So you can see in just these two examples then how every aspect of comedic science and ancient African science served a function that had to do with understanding how these things work. That is, predicting control, as the Western paradigm says, but it also was constantly re giving greater meaning to the whole kind of cosmic meaning of things. And I submit to you that melanin is, uh, has already demonstrated its ability to be able to generate the same kind of capability in terms of our study of that, of that picture. OK, let me hear what questions you have. Did that make sense? I didn't know what I was going to say as I started. I so I hope it made more sense to you than it did as it evolved in my head. You know? But uh, that's, uh, that, that's what I, I, I think that's right, though. <laughs> Yes. So it seems from what you said then that uh, the study of melanin is going to be, you know, in direct conflict with the uh, paradigm of the Western society. So the way that we are studying it. Now remember, now Westerners are studying melanin. They've had massive international conferences on melanin, but they've studied it only as a biochemical phenomenon. They've only talked about it at the level of the of the biology. The way that we are talking about it is going to generate some real conflict. So if you uh, you know come through with some proofs and whatnot, um, what what kind of conflict do you foresee? Will it be? Uh... Well, you see, people. One one of the things about theories is that you can always find documentation for your theory. One of the things with truth is that truth eventually stands on its own two feet and eliminates the theories. So I think that the this paradigm does not talk about truth. This paradigm talks about theory. So it will be the argument of their theory against our theory, because they will be perceiving it as theory. They don't realize that we've gone outside of the box of theory and into the circle of truth. So they will be attacking it with theory, but our response will be in terms of truth. Okay. So the conflict will be is that they will try to fit, you know, they will try to fit non-empirical data into an empirical box, and it's not going to fit. It's simply not going to fit. And I, but I, I'm very, but I, so, so the, the criteria for assessing the legitimacy of this research is going to be seen in a much broader sense than the kind of limited ways that they will argue against it. You know, but I'm sure that they will have very strong arguments. You know, for example, most of the scientists just dismiss Francis Welsing's early argument. You know, I mean, they, they just completely dismiss that as being, as, uh, being relevant. But their interest is more in terms of just the whole biochemical prospect of, 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 of the skin color. You know, certainly, I, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that probably one of the most important of medical interests for Caucasians is the study of melanin because of its relationship to melanoma, which is probably one of the most common forms of skin cancer, which is almost 99% occurring among white people. So even if they don't want to know about it for any other reason, it's very clear that this is one form of cancer that they get in epidemic proportion that we get almost not, it almost doesn't occur among people with high melanin content. So that's, that's the level at which they want to analyze it. But they are about to deal with these other kinds of letters, who knows? So it'll be the same old stuff, you know, like, you know, you, we'll send our materials to them to be published as, oh no, this doesn't satisfy a certain kind of scientific criteria. Or you go to a conference and they will get up and argue that this does not fit in terms of biochemical research as we know it, you know, uh, you know, so they'll be arguing out of their box. And so therefore, if Dr. Stewart wants to use some of her work in melanin to get promotion in San Francisco State, they may or may not accept it as legitimate knowledge even. You know, they fired Frances Wilson from Howard because she pursued this question. 
I mean, Howard, the, you know, the black school in Washington, D.C., you know, talking about black folks, and a black psychiatrist got fired by black folks for pursuing the issue of, the, of, 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 of something about the, the life and fate of black people. But this, the, 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 the concept itself was so frightening, even at the very, it was, I, I must say, the most surface level that she dealt with it. And I really think that is really the most surface level. I mean, you can just see that. That's just real on the surface. That scared the hell out of those people there. Now, if they talk to people like Richard King, they may kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I mean, at home, they just might kill him. <laughs> you know, I know they won't let him come to speak. You know, I know that. You know. And I mean, it's just because I think of, of the, I think there's almost kind of an unconscious recognition on the part of people that there's something in this stuff. I mean, I think it's, it frightens white people, and I think it scares the hell out of black people. Because it begins to open up the door on our potential, our greatness on the one hand, and our responsibility on the other. And I think that really frightens people when you begin to tell them that your excuses are no longer existent. The door to your powers have been reopened. You now must take responsibility. Oh, no, let me go to the plantation. <laughs> you can't have it. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably should know this, but I don't. Uh, you talk about neuromelanin as an agent that sensitizes you to the external stimuli and internal. And, uh, and then as such, it has some connection with the soul. Mm -hmm. What I don't understand is that connection with the soul based on the fact that melanin is, uh, is, is uh, genetically transmitted from, from one ancestor to another ancestor, or is it uh, something to do with more spiritual something that I really just don't uh, have a good hold on? Okay, the, 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 the road to the soul is through the consciousness. Okay, the road to the soul is through the consciousness. In other words, the soul is an entity of our being. But the way that we come to know our soul and to be at one with our souls and to develop our souls is through consciousness, it's awareness, all right? The one thing that melanin seems to be very strongly uh, uh, a part of and an instrument of is consciousness. What do you mean by consciousness? Awareness, the ability to know, the ability to perceive, okay? Western science says we perceive through the five senses, feeding into the central nervous system, translated by the brain, and that's the way we know what we know. And that's the source of consciousness. Melanin suggests that not only do we perceive through the five senses, but we now know that the very nature of the biochemistry of melanin itself picks up information. So vibes, vibrations, you know, there are, you know the vibrations that come through light give us vision. The vibrations that come through sound give us hearing. The vibrations that fit into none of those categories can actually be picked up through the melanin because of its higher sensitivity and higher levels of receptivity. Uh, 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 Dr. Barnes, Carol Barnes, the biochemist at this conference last weekend, was talking about the perceptiveness and how melanin picks up, uh, uh, picks up vibratory vibrations at almost all levels of the spectrum. I don't mean the light spectrum, I mean what he called the radiation what do you call that, radio? Electromagnetic. The electromagnetic radium, uh, radium st uh, spectrum. So melanin picks up sensations all along that, that kind of thing. So that means then that you, through your melanin content, can actually know, perceive, and be aware of realities that transcend just the five senses. Now we're not talking about touch when we talk about that. We're talking about sensations of, of higher vibratory information. So psychic phenomena, telepathic phenomena, the ability to know information that is already passed, you know, the ability to pick up things that people are simply feeling, emotional things, the way that our children can dance even before they learn to walk very well and dance rhythmically, you know, what brothers can do with basketball with the balls, you know, phenomena kinds of things, you know. And the fact that, you know, 10 years of Arthur Murray still can't teach white people how to dance. You know, I mean, like, you know, they can put all the feet on the floor they want to, but the ability to get that coordinated with the rest of them becomes almost an impossibility. And as I said, like, you know, our children are almost doing it before they can walk very well. And the way that that's learned, the way that that's done, has to do with the sensing capability of what melanin is really all about. So my argument is, is that 
because of its because of its higher sensitivities of, along other dimensions, of higher sensitivities and other ways of perceiving, all of that feeds into the general pool of consciousness and therefore has a direct hookup to the soul in that sense. So that, that, that's how the neurological aspect of it is tied with that. Now Dr. King, of course, talks about it from another perspective when he talks about the black dot and blackness and unconsciousness being the, the source of consciousness. That's all like the black hole theory. So it's another way of talking about it from a neurological point of view. It has to do with sensation and consciousness. And all this reception takes place in the reception, uh, say the ability of melon to act as a receptor then. And what part of the body does it occur? Everywhere. Everywhere. Plus above it. <laughs> because you see, it seems that not only does it serve as a transmitter through the central nervous system as we already know it, not only does it is it able to like receive directly through the, the you know through its own biochemical content, but it seems that the melanin also radiates, radiates receptors outside of the body. So it seems that we, we are encircled by a kind of receptor, of, almost kind of a radar that, that encircles us. Uh, Carol Barnes was telling us on last weekend that uh, the high melanin content in our hair that curls it up. And he says that the, the curled, kinky hair is actually like a satellite like disc. You look at it, and it really is. It's curled up just like a disc. It's the same principle as a satellite receiver, a, a, a disc, a disc. So it is, in fact, like our hair is actually serving as receptors that pick up energies like our, our, the, the, the field kind of around us. So not only is it coming through the ordinary receptors that we, are, we, we usually think of, it also is, in fact, feeding us from another source of information. So it seems that melody processes information on its own, you see. So it doesn't have to go to the brain. Exactly. It actually, it processes, it, 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 it sends messages to the brain. But what he was suggesting is that it actually processes information on its own, and it will change its structure to accommodate to what it's processed. You know? So when you walk into a room and you feel bad vibes, you feel bad vibes, and you start feeling a little sick and stuffy, and you want to get out the room, it's because the melanin has actually picked up the negative energies coming from the people in the room and has transformed you in such a way to give you a composure to avoid that circumstance, just as you would get a hot fire. And you avoid it. You know, like, uh, like an automatic, autonomic avoidance response that occurs with physical pain by feeling the emotional vibes, hostile vibes, actually works autonomically to transform itself so that the melanin that makes you sick so that you have to leave that environment. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's really heavy. And I mean, we just opened the door. I mean, this is done like on part-time thesis and research. So there's not a place in the world where there's a laboratory for the study of melanin. I mean, the first conference sponsored by African scholars was the pre-conference last weekend on melody. So this is just like a glimpse of the potential that's there. But we have like, we have significant evidence to suggest there's a certain de degree of validity to at least the things we're speculating about now, that we have, there, there are lifetimes of research for a whole generation of people just about, to just begin to get to some of these questions. This is probably on the same line. So if you had a dream that somebody died and they did die mm -hmm. that following week, so what you're picking up on this person's energy, or is it because it's all one mind and everything is connected? That's it. If you see, time is in fact a, is a relative dimension. I mean, like, you know, time is a relative. And the, the clearest example of time, of course, is that right now it's uh, 6 o'clock in my home. I mean, so this same day that we are experiencing right now has already been experienced by them but they're experiencing it right now, okay? I mean, and, and I, I, I didn't realize how heavy that was until I went to, to Korea about four years ago. And you passed the international, uh, the international date line, okay? So we left on Friday night and arrived on Monday morning because we jumped the date. So when we got there on Monday morning, it was still Sunday, though it was Monday, and it was the same time. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and that's what time is. So it really, so time actually is an imposition of another box 
of this whole dimension here. So your future life and being is taking place now in the higher time dimension. What happens with telepathy and, and the ability to see the future are people who are able to somehow block, break out of that boxing up so they can begin to see time in the bigger sense. So you can then see deaths that are coming. You can see events that have always passed. So the past and the present are still very much here, you know, because what is, you know, uh, this is almost what well, this is already yesterday to people in, uh, uh, in, in Eastern Europe now. So today is already yesterday to them. So they can actually know what's, what's going to happen tomorrow, today, if they know what we're doing now, you see. So it's the same thing just in terms of your psychic capabilities as well. So time then is just that kind of relative dimension that's imposed on that. So that's how that becomes possible. And because, of, of because, because melanin perceives along such a broad dimension, you know, that with the ability to develop an awareness of the things that's coming in through that information, you can begin to know much more effectively things that go across time. And space. Also, he had said, Phil Barnes had said that black women, too, had the highest. The ability. highest ability of all. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 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 Well, what about people like Sylvia Brown? Mm -hmm. Sylvia Brandon? Brown. I, I don't know Sylvia Brown. Well, she's a psychic, and she's renowned for her work that we can call her, but she's Jewish and claims that she was Egyptian oh. in her ex-life. She might have been. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I, I, you know, in the same, you know, I do not buy the, the argument for a moment that by virtue of the fact that you have a predominance, that you have a lower melanin content, that you are incapable of the capabilities that melanin permits you to have. Because we also know quite clearly now that you can be peripherally low in melanin producing content, but very high on other dimensions. In other words, your neural melanin can be much high, more highly developed than your surface melanin. Our argument is, is that probably people of African descent have a higher concentration in both spheres. You know? So the fact that you, know, that you have a lighter skin than the sister next to you does not mean then that she has greater psychical capability than you do, because we can't always see it. And see, that's the point. Melanin is simply not a tangible thing. It's just not a tangible uh, issue. You know? However, there is, a there is a veridical relationship. That is, that people who have a high melanin content on the surface also tend to have a high melanin content in other ways uh, as well. But you can't, you can't be reduced to that. So that means that they're very clearly, it's possible that there are Caucasians with low melanin surface content that have high melanin capabilities in the sense that they have high internal melanin, neural melanin. Yes? Would that make them more or less racist? The fact that they, what would make them more or less racist? The fact that they would have a higher neural or um, melanin. Would that make them less racist? Yeah, more. I think Francis Wellesley could argue to make them less racist. But for Francis Wilson's theory is that you can't get out if you're white, period. All white folks are racist by definition, according to her, her level of talking about this, you know. And so I mean, and dealing with it as a kind of a social psychological phenomena, you know, she's probably right to some extent, in the sense that all white people profit from racism, rather they are racist individually or not. So as a social psychological phenomena, that's probably true. Go ahead. Um, what I'm curious about then in, in dealing with Miss Wells and Dr. Wells and is, then does that make, say like historically, say BC, 332 BC, all right, um, does that make those who went into Egypt going in from a racist point of view or going in just conquering, you know, to be conquerors? Her argument is, is that Europeans did not realize their situation until they began to move out of Europe and encounter African people, black people. And every place they went, they ran into people who could produce color. I mean, they, you know, they went, into, they went into, into Northern Africa, there were people who produced color, they went to Asia, there were color producing people, they came to the Western world, there was, I mean, came to America, there was color producing people, the South Pacific, every place they went, they found people who were able to produce color, except in Europe. And it was only then that they realized that first of all, they were the world's smallest minority, and secondly, they realized that they, had, they were the only ones on the earth who were least likely to be able to produce color. 
And it was, and she said there was almost kind of like an intuitive recognition that there was a danger of their genetic annihilation. So they did not go into Africa for that reason. But it explains to us why they began to try to take on the African life once they went in there, to try to destroy it in terms of its origins and to imitate it simultaneously. And that, that's the whole paradox of the kind of conquering that took place. There was an effort to put down African life but at the same time, a very strong identification with it. And there's always been a strong emphasis on intermarrying. But intermarrying that they could control while limiting the intermarrying from the other side. Yes? Does that, all right, then what about, say, racism amongst people of color? Say, like, we have racism amongst ourselves. That's a learned phenomenon. That, that's, that's some slavery pathology. That's so then melanin doesn't say prevent something. No, we learn that from white people. No, we just imitating white people, that's all. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> that, that, that's not our theory. I mean, like, I, we don't need racism. No, we don't need racism to deal, to answer our problems. They needed racism to deal with their problem. That's where they protected themselves from that genetic annihilation. But we don't need that. So when we, and you're right, we, are, we can be strong racists. Howard University, for example, you know. But I mean, that kind of racism is something that we have learned from, from them. Yeah, I cannot get yeah um, uh, Dr. Barnes talked about the melanated center of the body mm -hmm. and how, and how yeah. you could be, um, that, you could, that you could have a great deal of those in one center right. and very little in another. Right. And uh, I think, uh, uh, from what I understood, I didn't really get a clear understanding of it, but I think what he meant that even though we were highly melanated, we could still be lacking in some areas. Absolutely. Uh, as far as melanin is concerned. Exactly. And I think that, um, I don't know if you had that information. <laughs> I, I, did, I, I was trying to find out the list of those sentences he gave us. Also, too, he talked about the pineal gland calcification and was saying that when right. Europeans have it, that it makes them logical and barbaric, have a barbaric nature. When, they, when, the, when, the, when the pineal <laughs> calcifies. Yes. Right. However, the calcification of the pineal also occurs in black folks, yes. but it does not occur as, as frequently as it yes. does in them. Yes. Exactly. Right. But there are, but he did talk about the melanin centers, right. you know. And the fact that you can have, and what he argues is that uh, that African people have higher concentrations in all of the centers usually. How it becomes very possible to run into something like this a Jewish woman who may have high melanin concentrations in all the other centers except in the skin color part. And by the way, the skin is one of the melanin centers. That's just one of them. But there are other centers as well. I've got it written down. I don't have it here uh, uh, with me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. As far as Howard University is concerned, do you think it was the people that were that give the most money to the university that would stop them? That's the other town puppeteers. Though they're the ones who, you see, the people who control the finances, just like on the plantation, they never have to be present to let the plantation run smoothly. All they have to do is put them some good Negroes in positions of power. <laughs> Tell them, look here, boy. You know, you are the most important boy I know. But you are the chief here. You're in charge. So you run this thing, boy. And they're going about their business. And those boys run it better than boss could ever hope to run it. So I mean, I mean, we are often more protected. When we put in those positions of looking out for the welfare of white people, we often end up being more precise, more treacherous, more determined to look out for boss's welfare than he is himself. You know? And it, by the way, it's not just how it's, you know, most of our institutions end up being that way. Yes. I have a question. You talked about different concentrations of melanin in different parts of the body, but if uh, at the point of conception uh, you have the three germ cells, and if melanin is this, as those uh, layers or those cells uh, develop to form different layers of skin, and, and your melanin goes into the um, the neural membrane that goes yeah, into the surface. All that, and it, and it goes through the uh, dividing process like a cell. How do you end up with a higher concentration in one area than another? Well, I think that one of the, I think, I think the melanin is originally found in the, neural comp in, in the neural membrane, but the evidence is that we are finding increasingly is that it gets dispersed throughout the entire system. So it isn't limited to the, the, to the neural membrane. You know, the body is not fragmented, it's interrelated. And so the fact that it occurs like in different centers in, in, you know, throughout the body is in fact you know, a legitimate possibility. So you know, the, the, it, it's like a, um, uh, even something that is as constant as body temperature can vary tremendously in various areas of the body. Yeah. 
you know, I mean, on a constant basis, you know. And so I mean, is that, and so you can you can find that diversity. Certainly, you can find diversity in concentration too. Look on the surface of your skin. I mean, look at the high melanin concentration in the areas of highest sensitivity around the genitals, around the nipples, around the lips. You know, the areas that are most sensitive in the body have high concentrations of the of, of the surface melanin. Even you know, the more sensitive the area there is, the more dark it tends to be. You know, and then you get to other parts of the body. The body can become a much be a much lower concentrations. So you have variations just in terms of the observable aspects of melanin. Are there any other articles such as um, Dr. King's back down? Um, no, he's the one who's really pioneering that work. And I don't know of any, anyone else who's doing a work in that. But you see, uh, that's just intended to turn you on anyway. So you can write the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and you've got to begin to look at it that way. I mean, you, this is just an exciting time to be alive if you know what's happening. Because I mean, you know, the, the fact you're talking about opening the new doors to the pyramids, you know, the passages that people couldn't get into, that's what we're doing. And so the, the capability to find the tremendous riches into the, all these hidden chambers that have been hidden for all these decades, you living in a time when we actually begin to open the secret chambers of the ancient wisdom of our people and the possibilities for your life and your children's life in terms of exploring and beginning to rebuild on the basis of that is just infinitely exciting. You know? So don't expect all the answers to be there. Find out as much as you can about what's there. And then when you find out you've run out, jump into it yourself and begin to produce, you know, begin to do the research and make the observations that can begin to say. Because the point of it is, is that the nature of the information will, you're already prepared for that. So once you've gone the limits of what's there, then begin to draw on the teachers that have been waiting to teach you for several thousands of years, and then take you the rest of the way. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, you've been an exciting group of students, oh, not just here, but throughout the, uh, you know, the, the several classes I've done, and uh, makes me tempted to want to be out here in the Bay Area, where folks <laughs> seem to be somewhat interested in learning. It's hard enough for me to get, it's almost impossible to get a, uh, enough students in one black psychology class to offer the course more than once a year for the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we have about 23,000 students and probably about 2,200 black students. And out of that 2,200 black students, it's almost impossible to get enough students to take the course, uh, to, uh, uh, to keep the course offered more than once a year. You have to almost go around beating people in the class to get them in. To get here? Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean? No, I thought maybe you teach it. Oh, I do. I teach at Florida State University. Yeah, I'm on leave this year. And I'm doing some writing, I'm doing some research. In addition to that, I'm also doing some guest lecturing at several places, San Francisco State, at Bethune Cookman College. I'm literally doing this several times during the year. And so this is just a component of my sort of kind of a sabbatical that I have. But no, I'm full-time uh, in, in, well, full clinical psychology and the Black Studies program at Florida State. I'm joined by a point there. Florida State yeah. in Tallahassee, Florida. Right. I have a question. In terms of uh, black doctor and the ability to uh, bring to the present knowledge, uh, knowledge in the past, how does this work, really? I mean, does it? Uh, Who knows? <laughs> How's the crystal ball work? You know, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. In other words, I'm not sure that there is a concrete process about how it works. It's like, it's like you know, jumping into a pool and uh, just simply being able to make utilization of all the water that's there. And, you know, and, and, and once you understand this, the, the point that I made earlier about the, kind of the timelessness and the spacelessness. I don't, I don't really have no idea what you're saying. Yeah, because of the box. I mean, that's, right. I mean, and, and that's not a good I, mean, I struggle with that. And, but don't be frustrated by that. I mean, don't be frustrated. Just try to accept the fact that some things just are not going to fit into the box. So you're going to say, okay, I have to take this on faith until I can get, some, get, get a better feel for it. You know? Because faith is also a teacher. Yes, faith is also a teacher. But you see, faith does not operate in the box. 
You've got to have empirical, concrete, verifiable, measurable, all that stuff in order for it to fit in the box. But much knowing, in fact, I would say the greatest to be known is the faith about what can be known. You see, that's a teacher in and of itself. And, uh, and I think that, that kind of information, you know, so some things just won't fit. You know, and I really could not begin to tell you how that kind of thing works. One of the things that I've always found very funny is the effort to try to measure psychic phenomena. You know, the Rhine studies at, the, uh, at the Duke University where they've always tried to quantify telepathic abilities and things like that. And I've always gotten very unpredictable kinds of results. And I think they will always do that because what the effort is is to try to, re to fit a higher reality into a smaller form. And I don't believe it can fit into that kind of predictable, measurable, verifiable form like that. It just, it doesn't, it, it, it does not, it does not fit into that kind of, it's like trying to compare, uh, you know, African dance with uh, Arthur Murray's dance studios. You know, I mean, like, you know, how do you translate the complexity of what African dance is into an Arthur Murray model? I mean, it just won't fit. Now, Arthur Murray does what he does very well. You know, Western science does what it does very well. But there's no way to put what African dance is into feet drawn on the floor and numbers that teach you how to step through them, you know. I mean, how do you coordinate the movement of the eyes and the blood in the arms and the gyrations of the spirit plus the connection of what is learned while it's going on? It's like Winter Marcellus said, talks about the fact that um, the easiest music to learn is Western classical music because it's written down, it's always the same. You just play it, you know. Uh, jazz is created every time it's played. So the, the, the music that is most difficult to learn is the music that remains musical, may, remains orderly, remains correct, even when it is being spontaneously evoked. And everyone who plays it, plays it differently, you know. And therefore, there's no way to ever replicate what is really a jazz selection. Because real jazz is always created by the moment. Now, how do you put that in writing? You know, I mean, how do you put that on a score? You can't score it. It transcends scoring. And when you put it on the score, you end up with something other than jazz. It's not jazz anymore, because once it's put on paper, and it's limited to that, now you can put it on paper. You know, I mean, like, you know, jazz musicians do write down their music, but when you are locked into what's on the paper, then it's no longer jazz, you know? And it's the same thing I think about this whole psychic thing. You know, you can put it down here, but once you put it down here, it's no longer a psychic phenomenon. Yes? I've had a lot of psychic things that have come to me or I've picked up on, and I know it used to frighten, because, you know, it's like you don't want to think things and then they happen. Right. And then if you tell somebody, you know, they don't believe you until it happens, but it was hard for me to accept a lot of the things, because it was like your body rejects it. But well, your mind rejects it, the box rejects it. The box rejects it. <laughs> right. And then it keeps coming, then you just have to accept it. Yeah, it's, it's here. And you, you can't say where it comes from. And you see, the, the, the argument that the empiricists make against the psychic people is that the psychic people can't tell you how they get what they get. You know, they always say, well, how do you know it? I, say, I just know it. Explain to me how you, okay, you know it so well, tell me what's going to happen when I walk out the door. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen to you. But I can tell you that when you said that, I also saw that your secretary probably is going to be pregnant next month. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> you see, so you can't answer the question they want you to answer, but you can answer the information that comes to you. I mean, even though they're psychics who learn how to harness their abilities, they still would find be hard put to tell you how they know what they know. They know what to do to enhance their knowable, their know, their, their knowing capacities. You know, some of them have learned how to, you know, to do bones and cards and music and use other kinds of instruments and I mean they learn how to do things that they, when they really want to get a lot of information they can fast for several days and they know how to refine their themselves as receptors but they still can't tell you how they do what they do so that's why empiricists just write them off you know this is not legitimate because she can't tell me how she did it even though she did it I admit it but it was probably just accidental coincidence that has nothing to do with anything that's real <laughs> So being um, enlightenment, enlightenment, uh, enlightenment um, would be somewhat, you, could, you can't really measure that as well. No, you can't. Yeah. Uh, the ultimate measure of enlightenment becomes uh, 
They are taking the peace in God consciousness. I think the religious people talk about it in that kind of language. You know, the ultimate enlightenment is to come into nirvana. The ultimate enlightenment is to come into paradise. The ultimate enlightenment is to come into heaven. The ultimate enlightenment is to develop a oneness of consciousness with God Himself. You know, uh, to develop the, the, the finite and to bring the finite intelligence, a uh, consciousness uh, into uh, into the broader absolute consciousness. You know. So I mean, those are the kind of terms that people use, but I don't know what that means, yeah. you know. But all you can do is talk, it, it's like, you know, it's like ants, it's like ant trying to describe the functions of men. And I mean, they don't have within their limited capacities to talk about that. So, you know, we can talk about the gods, but we always reduce them when we do that. Mm -hmm. But all you need is the goal. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got the goal, that's all you need. Is there chaos? It seems like there would be a great deal of chaos. Oh, the road is, but the solution transcends the chaos. Chaos grows out of the, 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 the conflict, the polar conflict that exists in material reality, the positive and negative. That's the source of conflict. But we also know that it is the source, it is out of conflict that light is illuminated. You see? So we get the electrical energy, we get light, literally <coughs> visible light from the coming together and the channeling of positive and negative energies. So the attainment of the enlightenment is over a road of conflict, and it's out of the conflict that it comes about. You know, you had said something about the gentleman who came up with the uh, curly hair being a satellite disc. Carol Box. Um, what I'm curious about is why did he focus in on, say, like, a curly hair? Why not say the whole body? You know, or the skull. Oh, he didn't say that to the exclusion of everything else. No, but the thing is, what I'm trying to get at is, oh. all right, it seems like for somebody who, say, perhaps, I don't mean it, you know, it may seem a bit off key, but for someone who's balding, with that many finger parts. I think it's five parts, but. Yeah, it's a No, but someone who's balding or who's completely bald. Would that make them less of a, you know, of a pickup? Oh, but my cell like this is <laughs> underneath the head. <laughs> See, my disc is right there. The ridges yeah. all there. That's what I'm no, no, I, I, no. He was saying that that's just one of the centers. You know, the, the hair, and particularly the highly curled, tightly curled hair, is just one of the centers. You know, but certainly there are other centers that are available as well. And you know, I, I, I really think, you see, I've also observed out of personal interest the fact, too, that the, the most of the spiritual leaders, the spiritual priests of Africa, as well as the spiritual priests of Egypt, shaved their heads. They took their hair off. And the Buddhist priests take their hair off. And every religious entity has some kind of statement about the hair and the covering of the hair. Uh, in the Islamic and Jewish tradition, the yarmulkes and the, the, the uh, kufis that they wear at the time of prayer and meditation, you know. And of course, the higher religious people have always shaved their hair as well. So there is obviously some kind of tie up with that, but I simply don't know what it is. But he, was, he, he really pointed to the Rastas as probably ones who recognize like that higher sensitivity that goes with hair, because they are very much into preserving the natural curl of the hair and in, in, in increasing that curl as a, as, a, as a source of greater receptivity, you know. So that's just one sign. So if the disc doesn't work, use cable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Chris. Uh, so I'm midterm. Look at all midterm.